There was a popular soap opera some 54 years ago, uh, maybe more than that, uh, started in 1954, uh, called As the World Turns, and uh, ran for 54 years. Uh, you might wonder why I know about soap operas running for 54 years, and in its height, it was the highest viewed soap opera, 10 million people per day. Well, it was viewing and on during, during my teenage years, and sometimes I was required to shell butter beans during the afternoon hours in the summer, and there wasn't a whole lot to watch on television. We had two channels that came in fairly good and one that was kind of snowy, and so in my process of trying to find the American bandstand, I would usually come across as the world turns, that soap opera. And it did run for 54 years. But John tells us that there is a day coming that not only will the world turn, but it will be shaken as well. Let's see what John had to say about that in, John, in Revelation chapter 6, beginning with verse 12. John writes, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. The moon became like blood, and the stars of the heavens fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its le late leaves uh, and figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded uh, as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. The kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? Father, help us to understand these few but powerful verses this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have been looking uh, at the book of uh, Revelation for some weeks now. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the first few verses that unleashed the first four seals, the first four horsemen of the tribulation. And we saw the Antichrist on the white horse uh, on the far left, uh, followed by... Uh, the uh, horse that brought war, that brought an end, the horseman that brought an end to the peace that the Antichrist had established. Then there was delivered the famine that came, the horseman that delivered the famine, and ultimately the pale horse of death. Last week, we saw a glimpse into heaven again. We transferred from that which was going on on earth to that which was going on in heaven, and we saw the martyrs that had died during the first part of the tribulation gathered together under the altar, crying out for vengeance uh, for their murders to those on the earth who had killed them. And now it's time to open the sixth seal. And as we open the sixth seal, we see in Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. We are now at the midpoint of the tribulation, and verse 17 tells us that the great day of the wrath of God has come. And he is going to shake the world. God shakes the world in the fierceness of his wrath. Now, I know we like to talk about the love of God. One of my favorite songs is entitled, The Love of God. And it talks about uh, looking at an ocean and realizing if that whole ocean were filled with ink and the sky was a parchment, and every blade on, on earth, every blade of grass on earth was a quill. To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. It's a good song. It's a good truth. Because the love of God is vast and amazing and wonderful. But folks, we have to understand there's more to God than just His love. Because He loves us, He disciplines us. 
No father ever loves his children who doesn't also discipline them to keep them from getting involved in things that would be harmful to them. No father would ever see his son or daughter get ready to stick something into an electrical outlet without doing something, without hollering at the child, saying something, maybe tapping the little hand just gently to say, no, no, don't do that because that would be dangerous to the child, fatal even. God is a God of love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to Repentance, Peter tells us. But God is also a God of justice. And with that justice comes wrath to those who ignore him. And he shakes the world. Now the word quake here, when it says the earth quakes, or there is a great earthquake, that word is the word seismos, from which we get our word seismo, uh, seismology or seismograph that indicates the quaking of the earth, the, that instrument that measures the movement of the earth. And anytime earthquakes are seen in the Bible, for the most part, they talk about the moving of God or the judgment of God. The wrath of God. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. Mark records very much the same thing. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places. Ezekiel talks about, For my jealousy... And in the fire of my wrath, I have spoken, God says. Surely in that day, that day of judgment, there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. Joel talks about the earthquake that is before them and the heavens trembling. Amos says, shall the land not tremble for this? And Haggai says in Haggai 2.6, for thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea, and the dry land. There's going to be a time of shaking of the earth. Now, there are three other occasions in the Bible that talks about uh, the earth shaking. One of those was when God gave the law on Mount Sinai, and the earth shook. Now, Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. At the crucifixion, Matthew records that the veil of the temple was torn in, top, in two from the top to the bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. And then the third time is at the time of the resurrection. Matthew again records that there was a great earthquake. The angel of the Lord descended from heaven and sat upon the stone as it was rolled away. So what is it going to look like? What is it going to be like when God shakes the earth in this final shaking, in this final moving of the earth? Well, chapter 12, uh, cha uh, verse 6 of chapters. Uh, Verse 12 of chapter 6 tells us, it says that the sky is going to be darkened. It says the sun becomes black as sackcloth. Now, it's not the first time that this has happened. When Jesus died on the cross in Matthew, it says that the sky turned dark from the sixth hour until the ninth hour. When God gave the law on Mount Sinai, we just read, the smoke filled the earth so thick that there was a darkness. Joel, too, talks about the sun being turned into darkness. Zephaniah talks about a day of darkness and gloominess. Isaiah 13 reports that there will be a time of darkness. The sun shall be darkened. Over in Ezekiel, God says, when I put out your light, I will cover the heavens and make its stars dark. 
I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give its light. Mark 13 says, In those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. When the, moon, when the sun is darkened, then there is no light to shine and be reflected by the moon, and the moon turns into a morbid shade of red, looking like it's filled with blood. A day like this happened uh, not too long ago when we had a blood moon here that we saw. But it also happened back in May, of, uh, May 19, 18, uh, 1780, when the sky got so dark in, new, in the New England area, and it stayed that way for a day and a half, not just a few hours, a day and a half. And it was so dark that you couldn't even write a letter if you were say, sitting next to the window. You couldn't see how to read if you were sitting next to the window in the middle of the day. Candles were lit at noon. The chickens went in to roost. The, the Connecticut legislature decide, had to decide whether they were going to continue meeting or disband. And you could, they couldn't explain what was going on. It couldn't be the clouds. You couldn't say that there was a thick uh, rowing of clouds because you could see the stars. And some have suggested that there was a massive fire, forest fire in Canada, but that wouldn't explain it because you could see the uh, stars. So if you could see the stars, how could that cloud of smoke obscure the sun but not the stars? I don't think so. It wasn't an eclipse because it lasted too long, a day and a half. And to this day, it hasn't really been explained, but it's in the annals of history that it happened. So this is not some fairy tale that is beyond belief. This is something that has happened in the past. But there's more, not just that the, scar, the sky became black as sackcloth and the moon became like blood. In verse 13, it tells us that the stars began to fall from heaven to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. The word here for uh, falling is the word aster, and it's the word from which we get uh, our word for asteroid. And any luminous body in the heavens beyond the sun and the moon are considered asteroids. And when they fall through the sky, they, uh, they appear to be as stars falling as they drop into the earth's atmosphere. Uh, this happened in November 13, 1833. There was a, a great meteor shower, a, a falling of asteroids uh, caused by the passing of the earth across the orbit of uh, meteorites. And the meteorites came into the uh, gravitational pull of the earth. And when they did uh, and encountered the earth's atmosphere, they lit up as on fire and fell to the earth. And people thought that Revelation 6 was coming true because there was such a uh, shower of meteors falling to the earth on that particular day. But also, the heavens rolled back, it says in verse 14. The sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. The heavens rolled back. I, I'm told that when the shaking of the earth happens, there is a phenomenon that takes place. The earth has a hot thick core in the center, and around that thick core is uh, another core, another covering that is called the earth's mantle, and that earth's mantle is a very thick core that separates the hot, molten insides of the earth, core of the earth, from the outer core where we are now, so we don't experience that hot heat when we walk, uh, that mantle is some 1,802 miles thick. And to put that in perspective a little bit, that would be almost as far as from here to Salt Lake City, Utah. 
that Salt Lake City, Utah is about 100 miles further than this measurement is here. It's 1,802 miles. So if you think about getting in a car and driving to, Saint, uh, to Salt Lake City, Utah, that's the, the depth, the thickness of this mantle. And when that mantle, the earth begins to shake, that mantle begins to move, and it will appear to those on the earth that the sky is rolling back. That will be the impression that one gets as they look at this particular uh, phenomenon. But there's a second thing, or a fourth thing that's going to happen here, and that is that the, cloud, the mountains and the islands are moved. The cataclysmic shaking of the earth is going to cause the mountains and the islands to move. Suppose you're in Hawaii or you're on some other island, maybe even a smaller island like some of the islands on the coast of um, uh, North Carolina uh, that you cross over uh, on a bridge. And, and these islands are there. And when this happens... There's going to be a great terror. There's going to be a great shifting. And it's going to be as if the islands have broken loose and you're on a giant raft going out into the ocean. It's going to be a great phenomenon when the islands break loose. The, the terror of being on land that is being swept out to sea. It's something that you might think of in a, a movie, but these things are being played out not on a screen, but in real life this is what's going to happen when the great quaking of the lord and this judgment of this sixth seal begins to ha to happen so what's going to happen people are going to hide people are going to cry out what is their response they, are they going to turn to god and say god help us Verse 15 and following tells us, As the sky recedes and all these things happen, the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man, hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains, and they cried out, Fall on us for cover. They cry out, Fall on us and cover us. You see, sin has its horrors. Sin is horrible. A lot of people think that sin is pleasurable, enjoyable. And I suppose they have a point. I suppose there is a joy in experiencing the things of the world, the things of the devil. But it has its consequences as well. And sin is inclusive, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It includes everyone, the powerful, the weak, the mighty, and the peasant. The king who rules and those he rules over. The slave man and the master. It doesn't matter. Here it says that all of these, the kings of the earth, the great men, the powerful men, the men who have all the money and the prestige and the power to do whatever they want to do, and all the slaves, doesn't matter. They're going to all run and cry for the rocks to fall on them. It is a horrible thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. And that's what's going to happen. But it's not just the horror. It's the fact that they're trying to hide. People sometimes say, well, I don't care. I, I enjoy doing what I'm doing. And if I want to drink a, uh, uh, an alcoholic beverage or if I want to shoot up some drugs or if I want to be involved in this particular activity that is uh, illegal, that's my business. And I don't care who knows it. And you're going to care. One of these days, you're going to care. Because they run to the mountains and they try to hide from the evil, but they will not turn to God. There's no hiding place. It's like that old spiritual 
There's no hiding place down there. Well, there's no hiding place in that day for those who want to escape God. They're trying to hide, and they say, Fall on us. Hide us from the wrath of Him who sits on the throne and the wrath of the Lamb. But it brings also its hardness. People still are refusing to worship God. They're still refusing to turn to God. And I, I tell you over and over how the Holy Spirit is gone, so the Holy Spirit's not there convicting anymore. The Bible is here. They, they've got the Word of God. They could look at that, but no, they're not going to turn to God. They're going to turn to their own resources. They're going to go to the mountains and, and ask the mountains, fall on us so that we can hide from God. Sin hardens hearts. In Revelation chapter 9, verse 20 and following, John writes, The rest of the men who were, who were not killed by the plagues repented not of the works of their hands that they should worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood and neither can see or hear or walk. Neither repented they of their murders, or their deeds of sorceries, nor their fornication, nor their thefts. They saw everything that happened. They saw all the plagues, and yet they still refused to repent. Revelation 16, men were scorched with great heat, yet they blasphemed God, the name of God, for the heat which had power over these plagues, and they repented not to give Him glory. They had that scorching heat, but they didn't repent and turn to God. They blasphemed God of heaven because of their pain and the sores, and they repented not of their deeds. They cursed God because they had these boils on their body, but they didn't repent. They didn't fall on their faces before a merciful God. Verse 21 says, They fell up, uh, upon men great hail out of heaven. The weight of a talent. The weight of a talent is a hundred pounds. Hailstones weighing a hundred pounds. According to the internet, it is generally assumed that a normal man can carry anywhere between 90 and 135 pounds, depending upon his level of strength. These hailstones weigh 100 pounds each. The largest hailstones, according to the Internet, that have ever been recorded and weighed, weigh 2 pounds. These hailstones are 98 pounds heavier that are falling upon men, not just one that's falling, but they are crashing upon the earth, upon the cars, upon the buildings, upon the windows, everywhere that man is. Anyone caught outside is going to be hit with a hundred-pound hailstone. You're not going to survive that. What do they do? They blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail. The plague was exceeding great. The hailstones are coming down, and instead of crying out for mercy to God, they're cursing God, blaspheming His name. Revelation 19 says, The end of the great tribulation and the beginning of the great battle of Armageddon, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and the armies gathered together to make war against Him who sat on the horse and against His army. All of these people still thinking, after all of this judgment of God, that they can still defeat this one who is coming. You may say, well, they don't realize what it is and who it is that's in control. They don't realize, they, they just think this is some cosmic uh, figuration or configuration of whatever of the atmosphere and it's just happening. No, they understand. They understand clearly what's going on. Look at verse 17. 
They cry out. Well, uh, the last part of verse 16. They cry out to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of who? Him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. And people look at little lambs and they think, how cute, how precious, how tender, and they are. But this ram has another dimension as well. The lambs that we have today don't have any claws. They don't have sharp teeth to gnarl and, and disfigure people. They don't have horns to gouge. But this lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the earth, has the power with his mouth to send forth a two-edged sword piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And he will bring judgment upon the world. He will bring great judgment. So they know. They understand. They're crying out for to be hidden, not for mercy, not for any grace that, might, that God might dispense at that moment, but they're crying out for the rocks and the mountains to fall upon them. They prefer death over turning to God. They understand that the great day of His wrath has come. So when the world shakes, who's going to be able to stand? Right now, the world is spinning, and we're all doing just fine as far as our ability to stand and move. But in a time of an earthquake, when the earth begins to shake, people begin to fall and buildings begin to fall and everything else begins to crumble around you, when God shakes this world, who is going to be able to stand? The answer is no one. Now is the accepted time. Behold, this is the day to make sure your reservation for heaven is secure and sure. To make sure that when the world shakes, you're not in the world, but you're in heaven with God and the Lamb. Father, help us to understand the importance of this. Yes, it's fine for us to say, well, I, I know that I'll be in heaven and I will escape the shaking of the earth and, and I'll be up there praising you and everything will be fine. And that, that's great that we have that confident assurance and blessed hope. But what about our friends? What about the people we work with? We've grown to have a relationship with our neighbors, relatives, sons and daughters and extended family members, grandchildren, all of these who may not know you as personal Savior, those who have not made their reservation sure with you. Oh, Father, burden our hearts. Help us to see the importance and the need of sharing you with those with whom we come in contact. Because one of these days, not only will the world turn, but it will shake under your judgment and your wrath. Dismiss us with your blessings upon us and this truth burning in our hearts and ears. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.